So energy and biogas, we have, um, you know, 65%, I think I, 60, 65% and normal natural gas is 90%. So we really aren't losing, you know, that much for what we're putting into it. Um, and it is renewable. So we have about 600 uh, BTUs in each cubic foot of biogas, and cubic foot of biogas. And I, we're not gonna talk a lot about human waste, but that's the one, the one thing that, that I, that's a one-to-one -one thing about one, one day's worth of human waste from an average human, whatever that is, is about one cubic foot of gas. We don't, and we, we aren't, until we actually can get the, uh, the science correct and the, and, the, uh, and the legal aspects done and have uh, uh, some type of university entity work with us on this. We're not gonna be putting any human waste, liquid or solid, into that. However, in other, not in the United States or not in North America, but in other places in the world, the company that makes that unit also manufactures a nice little toilet kit. It's a hand pump thing that when you've finished your business, you pump this, it's like a boat almost. If people have been in a marine environment at all, is you pump a, a lever or a pump and it'll send it into the inlet or into, well, one of the, one of the inlets of the unit. You know, we have that, it's all set up for it, but, it, but it's not used. So, uh, you know, that's, that's on the radar. I mean, that's out there, but not in our country. So, you know, in some communities in, in developing nations, it's not only, uh, you know, there, but it's like, it's like a godsend. I mean, it's like, great, there's a place to put and use, um, you know, this, this, what would normally be a problem. So, and it's a clean, you know, a clean application. Um, so um, a cook stove will burn, just a stove top will burn about five to 15 cubic feet uh, an hour. And a uh, light, you know, a, a fairly decent, like, uh, I guess we know, we know them as century or camping lights, you know, a good bright light would burn about four cubic feet per hour. Um, so our, um, you know, I think our little, our little cook stove, you, that unit comes with a little tabletop cook stove, which I'll show you out there. That, that's about a 5,000 BTU per hour burning surface, which is a, equivalent to a small burner on a, on a regular uh, gas stove. Um, and I think we went through this uh, lighting space, heating, water heating, crop drying. That's the other thing I didn't mention. Uh, you know, in an agricultural situation, there's always a need for some kind of grain or crop drying. Um, and so the heat from the methane can, can do that, uh, you know. So then we have the digestion process. And so what, what happens to the, what's left over? So, you know, essentially we can separate it from the liquid, from liquids and solids. The liquid comes out when you fill it in, when you fill it up, or when you feed it, whatever you put into it's gonna, the equivalent amount of liquid is gonna come out of it at the other end. And I, um, let me see if I can get the, just a better picture of that. This is just a representation. We're filling it here. Now here's what I talked about, the seal. This, this water level does not allow, if the water level was down there, you'd have air coming in. We don't want that. So the water level stays up here because this pipe is narrower and that's narrower. The level in there is a little higher and that hits that point. And the biogas is under pressure. You know, it's creating pressure for the biogas. So the le these levels are a little higher. But what I'm saying is when you put, whatever you put in there, we put five gallons in here, five gallons is gonna come out of there. So we have this liquid. The quality of the waste is actually improved because the digestion process deals with the nitrogen and sort of weakens the, weakens the elements that aren't particularly beneficial and either builds up or, or leaves alone and, and, and also leaves alone the protein and the nutrients uh, in there. So it's basically a better product when it comes out than it is when it went in, um, as long as what went in is, is clean. And I'll explain that in, as we, we go on. Um, so the nutrient component remains the same. They're almost complete. The disease vectors are pretty much destroyed, not all of them, I don't want to imply that, but, but m not only most of them, but into the 90th percentile probably in, in most cases. And the, um, and the digesting, digesting of the manures eliminates the flies and the odor problem that you'd normally have with just, o with just odor, with just uh, manure out in the open. And I've had that running now. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a leak issue early on and um, it took me a long time to get this thing going. I had, I had uh, just some issues with a lot of different things. 
in its in its actual working form now. It's been going for you know weeks, and I have a bucket of uh, effluent there. Haven't you know? Haven't really used it. Uh, it's just been sitting there. I haven't seen a bug. I, I, maybe there is one. I, mean, I haven't really seen any flies or anything around there. Just not. It doesn't stink. You know, it's not. It, there's, no, there's a little odor to the whole process, but it's not offensive. It's just. You know, we'll see when we get down there. It's not like horrible. Uh, Could you explain the expansion chamber side a little bit more? Uh, I will later. Let me. Uh, I have better images than this. Um, so we have three, may, mainly three elements that we can control that make for good digestion. So that's going to be heat, pH levels, and uh, the carbon nitrogen ratio of the food you put into it. That is a, a long. The, when we get to the CN part, it's very well described in, in the handout. Uh, it's also very similar to the um, composting regimen we go through when we try to balance carbon and nitrogen, browns and greens, whatever. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on it, but I'm probably not going to spend as much time. You can read it and, get, and we'll save time to go out there and talk about other stuff. Um, but uh, we're going to talk now about heat, pH balance, and, and, uh, and the CN ratio. But the heat, as I said before, there's three different uh, levels of, um, you know, levels of heat input. So we have our, you know, mesophilic, our thermophilic, and then the, the uh, I think they call it psychophilic, which is the extremely low. And we don't even want to, we can't deal with that as just individuals. So I'm not even going to mention it other than to say it's below 68, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, it's what's below that. There are bacteria that work in that in that environment, we don't, you know, we don't mess with that. We're going to deal with mainly the mesophilic bacteria. And as I said, we're operating this thing between 80 and 95 degrees. I've had it over 100. I've had it down at uh, 67, maybe, I think. I, I should have brought my sheet. I have a log of every day. But mainly the idea is to run it at, you know, between 80 and 95. 95 is like perfect. And, you know, one caveat, and I will, I will mention it because this is a, a full year-round thing. We knew it going in. There is a, when it gets in the cold weather, that greenhouse is not uh, enough to keep it, you know, to keep it at the proper temperature. It's going to fall below, you know, well below 80 degrees and even, even 60 degrees or, you know, whatever. So uh, we do have an um, electric aquarium heater, 300-watt heater that goes in there. Um, that's not an unusual thing. I mean, it's, it doesn't, it's mainly for the nighttime. Um, I have put it in there now just because I wanted to set it up and see the difference between not, not and, and having it. Uh, the um, larger, when designing a system, when it's engineered systems, they, they um, start from scratch with that. It, there has to be some amount of heat input. There's not, in our climate, North American climate, there's no way that it's going to work in a mesophilic environment, let alone a thermophilic environment, which is 130 degrees, it's not going to work without some kind of heat input. The good news is that the heat input, in our case, is, would be about a quarter, up to a quarter of what you, it depends on the temperature outside, but up to a quarter energy-wise, calorie-wise, of what you're going to get out of it. So it's not, a, it's not a losing battle. You're giving up something to get you know, much more. So that's, you know, that's that. In the summer, not, a, not as big an issue. Fall and winter, we'll see. Uh, well, fall and winter and even early spring, we'll see. I'll just have to figure it out. Um, I don't imagine we're going to get away with, you know, with too much of, too many days outside of summer where we're going to not have to have some input on it. So basically, we're looking at, in a, in a mesophilic situation, which we're, we're operating at, the, the 80 to 95 degrees, we're looking at about 15 days to 50 days of digestion period. Um, in other words, till, till it actually you know, starts and then, can, and then cranks out gas. Um, I think we started here, took about two weeks. Like it's almost two weeks to get it started. Um, I've talked to other people. It took almost a month to get it started. Uh, I think the Appalachian State people, even less, less than two weeks, it just, it just went. But... Uh, I know they have been heating theirs consistently, so it's they use a mat underneath, like a like a uh, bed growing bed mat type of thing, um, water bed maybe heating pad, and uh, and so that's been uh, used 
consistently with, with theirs. The thermophilic bacteria, the high, the high temperature ones, I'm saying operating in the 100 to 130 range, that'll kick off, and that's a lot, a lot less time. It's maybe, maybe five days to, I don't know, I have it written down here, five days, four, 14 to 16 days. Uh, I think it's even probably less than 14. Um, I mean, we were getting, I was pretty close to 14, so I would say it's probably less than that. Uh, the other one we're not going to worry about because we can't do it anyway. Um, so basically, um, our, our, our really cool operating temperature is going to be ideally 95 to 98 degrees, somewhere in there. It'll be okay from 80 to 95. And then when we get below 80, it's, it's very slow going. Um, and there's different profiles. I mean, there's and this is all depending on the materials you put in and how much you feed and how much water you put in, but some things create gas early on in the cycle and then drop off very suddenly. Some, what I'm saying is they create a lot of gas early on in the cycle, then, they, then it drops off. Some of them create gas slowly and then just level out. It's a nice, reliable, consistent thing, and then it drops off very predictable. Some times uh, it will be very slow and rising, and it may build up at the very end and just drop that's not very common, but, but that's something you sort of learn with what you're putting into it. And you can see from the gas bag, that the bag, that, this actually is, is their home biogas two unit. We have the one, the original version. This is a two. It has a larger storage unit, and it's a little more engineered, a little more substantial. Essentially, this is the, the back end of it, the, out, the outlet where the effluent, she's gathering that liquid. And the gas is from here. From that point upward is the gas bag. And from that point downward is the, uh, effl is the uh, digestion bag. So we have a 24, 24 cubic foot gas storage. I believe that's more, but I don't know what it is. So we can watch that and it'll, you know, it'll fluctuate. I mean, usually it just fills up. And if I, if I really want to super feed it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to really get, you know, full, hard full. Um, at some point it can bubble. It can... Um, the pressure can be enough that uh, it will it will bubble out through the liquid, but uh, it's essentially a self-regulating thing because the um, the gas the operating the range is about three inches of water column to six inches of water column, and a water column is I think there's 28 inches of water column, 27.6 inches of water column for every pound per square inch. We're all used to talking about psi or pound per square inch. Well, one pound per square inch has 28 water column elements in it. The reason they call it a water column is because it's a tube of water of a certain diameter, a tube, and they mark it with inches and pressure, uh, a certain amount of pressure goes in, it pushes that water up the tube to the mark, four, four inches, six inches, 10 inches. So a, a gas, say my space here at home, my little, my little space here at home runs at about nine to 11 inches of water column. This little thing runs at about four. Right now, we're probably only doing about two and a half because I purposely did not load the, uh, the, the weights on it. There's actually a, weight, a weighting system that makes the pressure, and I purposely wanted to keep it low to, to let the gas really build up and get going. Over six inches of water column, which is like 0.2 PSI, it actually inhibits the gas production because there's too much pressure in there for them. The bacteria don't like excessive pressure, so it'll, it'll uh, slow it down a little bit. So, you know, we try to maintain. Yeah. Being is how this gas digestion will work best in the summer. Yeah. And our heating major during the winter, is there a way to draw that gas off and clean it up and compress it into a metal tank? We do not, and I'm going to get into that in, at the end here, we, it's, not, it's not very compressible. It can be stored, but it's like it's stored at atmosphere or very, very little above atmosphere, but not too much because it, it takes like, it takes like, uh, minus, I don't, I don't remember the numbers, I, I wrote it down in there, minus like 200 degrees Fahrenheit or 171 or something, plus a pressure uh, of like close to 5,000 PSI to get it to turn into liquid, which is like ideal storage. But even compressing it to a, to a gas that's tight is, is a lot more beyond what we would be looking Not at. Effect. Not a cost effect, no. However, you can take the gas and feed it back into the heaters to heat the digester. So you can steal some of it to feed itself. And that's, you know, common. Another thing is a lot of, uh, on a larger operation, they have an engine, and some of them, they run on diesel too. The uh, water jackets, the radiator in the water jacket from the, from the generating engine will produce the heat to, or most of the heat to, uh, 
keep the methane digester cooking through the winter. You have to run it all the time, but that's you want to generate. That, that's how you do it. So, Richard, it seems to me like what we're looking at right now is cooking gas. It's yeah, we don't. That's and I'll, and I'll, I'll get into that point. We're not. We ourselves, with that little twenty-four uh, cubic foot storage, we are looking predictably at really only cooking gas and only lighting. You know, anything beyond that, uh, unless there's some arcane and small use of it, anything beyond that is just beyond the capability of that little thing. If you bought six of them, that's a different story. Or if you built a bigger one. Or if you bought a bigger one from somebody else, they're not the only people that make these things. I and mean, there's other designs um, that uh, are larger, and, and uh, you know, we can do that. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of uh, wastewater treatment plants that, that uh, generate methane gas and do compress it into, into compressed natural, uh, natural gas that's used in vehicle fleets. So it is, it's cost effective at the larger scale, but not at the, at the smaller scale. Yeah. It, right. it seems to me like would it be possible that you, I think you just referred to it, but I didn't make the connection. You could have the production in the summer and then take some of that gas and use it to heat your unit so you could keep it producing in the winter. <coughs> you could give up some of your production, but you could go through the winter with it. And yes. so if you had enough of them, you could actually heat with it. What? But then you make a bigger one instead, probably, right? Yeah, exactly. And what I wanted to do, and I, what I may do here, is to incorporate thermal solar energy. I purposely put it in a place where we had the sun, not just for the greenhouse, but for a future panel if we, you know, do, do that. It's not going to take care of all of it, but it's going to supplement it substantially um, with the proper storage, you can carry it well into the evening, not, not all through, not, not eight hours of nighttime in 20 degree weather, but it's going to help. And, and thermal solar is a very effective and inexpensive way to do stuff. So um, that's a, a good use of, you know, of that, that solar. <laughs>